Hi there, my name is Stevie Ritchie and welcome to Mind Over Matter TV. This is episode four. Mind Over Matter TV is all about mental health and of course, mental health affects us in so many different ways, mentally, physically, and of course, in everyday life. I for one all know about it because I've had it and are due to having having it many, many years ago. Um, today, we're joined by two amazing guests that I know really well through up and down through the years of social media and talking to each other, keeping up with each other's stories on our life. And they're here today to talk about mental health. So please welcome the one and only Craig and Deb, AKA Z and Sapphire. So first of all, I wanna to come to the lovely Craig here that I've known for so many yeah. years. Um, I mean, he did voice note me on WhatsApp yesterday and I, I was totally shocked by it, but obviously I want to hear more. No doubt you obviously do as well. So I want to come to you first, Craig. Yeah. Um, tell us, Craig, about your journey, uh, your mental health uh, history and everything else. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, it all began um, when uh, we were out shopping one day, just the two of us. Uh, on our day off from doing the entertainment side of things. And um, we bumped into one of my sisters, two stepsisters, and um, she came up to me and she said to myself and Debs, um, I've got news for you. And we said, what is it? And she said, um, did you hear about um, Sandra, my sister? What, what about her, what's wrong with her? Is she all right? No, she's, uh, she died. And I said, what do you mean she died? She's young, how can she die? And she said, well, she took her own life. And I said, nah, see, Sandra wouldn't do that. Sandra was a singer, you see, she was in the entertainment world. And she, she helped us a lot in her early days in music. And I, I, I couldn't take to it, what she told me. And I said, you have to tell me what happened, I need to know. She said, well, she had mental health problems. She had a lot of abuse in the family and stuff like that from a partner and stuff. And she says, but we don't know what side of it is to do with him. But the most important thing is she's not here anymore. And I says, why did not nobody come and see me? I've been on the TV a hell of a lot of times. You, you know how to reach me. You can go through an agency, you go through a TV company, somebody would find me, mm -hmm. you know? And everybody knows where we live in Edinburgh. So nobody came and found us. No family members, nothing. And then I, I started to say, what, what happened? I need the details now. She said, it'll shock you though. Well, tell me. She said, well, Sandra, she, she went out very, very late hours in the night, shops were all shut, etc. And she went in a phone box in Princess Street in Edinburgh on a corner, a place called St. James's Centre, a big shopping place that had a phone box there. It's no longer there for reasons, obviously. And she called the police and said, um, well, the authorities and said, I need, I, need a, I need the police and I need, I need help. Somebody needs to help me. And seemingly they said, what's wrong with you? Um, I, I think I'm going to kill myself. Oh. And they said, why don't you just go home, you know, this isn't going to happen. They didn't believe her, you know, and she says, look, I've got a razor blade and I'm going to cut my wrists. Oh, and if you don't get here right now, I'm going to do it. And then seemingly they just said, look, we're going to hang the phone up on you. And they hung up on her seemingly. And then she phoned them back and uh, she said, I told you I was going to do this and you're not listening to me. Look. We get callers like you all the time. And she says, here is where I am. She says, we've traced the call box, but we're not sending anybody out because they just thought she was crazy. And then wow. she, she, she ended up cutting both wrists oh. and she was bleeding out profusively. And she says, do you believe me now? I've cut both my wrists. And they said, well, we're not, what do you want us to do? We've got more time than wasting our time we use seemingly. There was all this sort of carry on back and forth. And she said, well, if you're not going to come in, she took you. Take your time, she take your time, Greg. It's all right. Well, I didn't ever realise how hard it still was to talk about that, but um, she, took, she took the razor blade and she went from one end to the other and uh, cut her whole throat open and uh, she died um, in that phone box falling out of it. The blood, I'm never normally going to de details, but it annoys me because they never listened to her and the blood went right down the hill out that phone box and she lied there, you know, dying on her own. Oh dear. And that, 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 that killed I me. I bet that was a lot for you yeah. to handle and this is all because yeah. 
someone didn't take her seriously, yeah. you know, they yeah. didn't listen to her, they yeah. just thought she was like everybody else and a bit crazy, yeah. and this, that's the reason why she felt alone, Yes, uh, and yeah. you know, re obviously really depressed, yeah. and no one ever knows what people are going through in their minds, they can no. smile through it, but yeah, deep yeah. down inside, you know what it's like, Dad, yes, you yes. know, it, it can be that sort of, no one's listening, no one really yeah. cares, I just might as well end it all now, and of yeah. course you must have, I don't, God knows what how you felt yeah. about it and how it well, made you feel inside. It was, we were ready to go into the shops and shop, and I did shop after it, but I, I said to her, why did you tell me that? And she said, well, just in case I never see you again, I had to tell you anyway. And then I was riled about why nobody could find me about even the funeral or anything. Because me and Sandra, we, we, we got in a house in front of the kitchen. She came to our wedding. Mm -hmm. uh, she helped us in music. She put us on the stage. She worked with student universities, put us on the stage. Well before we were even on singing on TV or on reality mm -hmm. TV shows. And we're in uh, the same area as you, Stevie. Yeah. And basically, um, I needed to know why nobody... And, and, and it, it hit at me for weeks and weeks. I had nightmares about her doing this. You know, I envisioned it, I, I seen it in my own mind's eye. And um, then I didn't realise about the whole mental health thing at that time. But then I realised it was it was hitting my mental health. Mm. And it was bringing me downhill. Um, I think I was drinking a bit. Yeah, no, it's all right, Greg, it's all right, sorry, it's all right, take your time, man. It's all good, it's all good. Let it all out, it's best to yeah. let everything out. Because then it, you know, you release everything. I'm, I'm going to give you a little break. Yeah, I'm going to come to your amazing, yeah, do beautiful do wife, Debs. Here, so yeah. Debs. Obviously, you've been together with Craig for many, many years. You're, many you know, years. you're married. You, you're a joint thing. You know, you are one, mm -hmm. and you're in the same business as me. Yes. You know, um, obviously, you've seen Craig grow through all this. Yes. Um, how did it make you feel? And um, you know, how did it make you feel inside? How did you help Craig? Well. I helped Craig in a way, like, um, I gave my shoulder to cry on and mm. things like that and let him talk away and let mm. him cry. Um, I think that was the best release that I could give him, yeah. you know, like, just talk about her, yeah. you know, um, get the wedding photos out and, and just talk about how we had a great day with Sandra and all the good memories that we had, yeah. Yeah. which we did. But, I mean, um, I feel that Sandra must have been pretty desperate to have um, done such a thing like that, you know. Of course. That, that it takes your, uh, it blows your mind actually. Mm. How could someone do that, you know? Yeah. It's scary stuff. Yeah. You know, um, but I mean, mentally it affected Craig inside, you know. He went downhill a bit, he started drinking and uh, it was really kind of a bad phase that he was going through inside. And you saw all this? Like, I saw yeah. all this and uh, I mean, he was having a drink, mm. but to the point that he couldn't remember what he was doing at the end of the night, you know, yeah. like wow. he just sort of just slept on the sofa, just uh, wow. we having a drink. And um, that was the only way that he could get through things, you know, just talking. Mm. Um, and that was his uh, comforter, you could yeah. say, it was a drink at that moment. But you know, um, like everything else, you do come through the other end, mm. and um, you, you do see the light. And it, it, it sort of coming coming off the drink was a good thing, I thought. You yeah, know, yeah. Um, because only drink makes you more depressed. You know. Of course, absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. So that that's what I saw in Craig. You know. Mm. But, um, but it must have affected you as well. You know, mentally uh, as well. Seeing you know your own husband go through such a, a, a really kind of hard depressing time drinking every night yeah. you know yeah. sleeping on the sofa when you you know you sleep in the same bed you know yes. it must have affected you and yourself and mental health didn't yes because some nights um when he was drinking and he fell asleep i had to just leave him there on the sofa <sighs> Um, yeah. He couldn't even make it through to the room to go to his bed. Oh it was, my gosh, yeah. it was a real shame to see him because it was a, a real mess, you know, mm -hmm. inside. But myself, I knew that I had to stay strong, you know, for him, which I did. And uh, thank goodness, you know, I, I did feel really like I went to cry, and it yeah. wouldn't have helped Craig any if I'd sat there crying. No. Yeah. Um, 
you know, so I just let him do what he needed to do at that time. To get through it. Yes, yeah. to get through the whole thing. And you um, were like the the, the, uh, the glue in yes. the relationship. You held it together. I did. You were the strongest out of the both, no disrespect yes. yep. to you, yeah, right? Of course, yeah, uh-huh. yeah, yeah, And right. she kept you, yeah. you know, kind of on that path of getting yeah. out of that dark place of and course, giving yeah. you her yeah. full support. Yes, which I did. Yeah, and um, he's thankful to this day that, you know, I didn't crumble the way he did because that would have been a really lonely yeah. road for two hours Oof. to go down, you know, if we were both doing the same thing. Yeah, a double whammy. You know, yes. yes. But, um, yeah, I mean, you have to still carry on yeah, and of course, function, yeah. you know, day to day. And um, I think that he's done pretty well in yeah. um, holding things together. I look at it now that yeah. uh, Sandra looks down from wherever she is up in the spiritual realm or the heavens above. Yeah. She'd be looking down and she'd be saying, I'm proud of you now, brother, but, you know, she would have probably, she would never have wanted me to go downhill like that. She would want me to get on with my life, you know. She took that turn, it's a point of no returning back, no, no turning back, and it's, it's, a, it's a serious thing. Um, I mean, I've heard of other people that I know that have took their lives with mental health, which I'll talk about in another show if we do that, and th- these were serious as well, but this was, you know, hanging yourself. But this was different from that. This was actually mm. taking a razor blade, and cutting your wrists, and then because you're still not getting any help, you're taking your 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 own throat out, your jugular, everything, oh, you God. know. And she left behind a small boy as well, you know. But it all goes down to you know families when the, when the uh, they lose touch, and it it, mm. it sort of annoys me that we done that. Um, it's nobody's fault, of course. But then I took the blame for that as well. If we stayed in touch, or if she stayed in touch. Is it my fault? Is it my fault? But now I look at things and um, I'd like to offer help, assistance, even with kind words to say, if you're going through that Mm. and you're losing family members, tell the people that you love them. You're not alone sort of thing. And, you know, obviously you've experienced it. You saw it first hand, you know, so... It's not a pretty sight, no. No. Someone's going through your, your, so your much. ultimate loved one. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. You had the whole world on his shoulders. I, I felt you were yeah. not coping very well. No, no. It, it just crashed. And at the back of that, then the COVID thing happened, and that depressed me even more. So that was worse. But then um, when we done our TV show, Moorish TV, we done that. That gave me something to work on because some of the artists that were on that. Sandra loved music. She would have loved what we're doing and would help a lot of bands that says what we're going to do We're struggling through mental health. Some people were really seriously ill mentally and says mm-hmm. I can no longer live. They survived to this day and one of them even uh, done a um, What do you call it? The artist that comes on before the band again. What do you call it? Oh, like a um, support. Uh, support, uh, support artist. Act, yeah. yeah, for, well for Tinchy Strider. One of them done Tinchy Strider. Oh, wow. After being on Morris TV. So it shows you that shows like this, this is a brilliant show this yeah. is a great show and I think that Sandra would look down and she'd be proud of what we're doing right now mm-hmm. and um, she was a big X Factor fan by the way oh. so she would have loved you thank you Sandra <laughs> but um, the m- most importantly is that you can come out of this yourself if you go through mm-hmm. something like this I went through a hell of a, a time Craig can I ask you know, how long um, if you don't mind me asking as yeah. well like, but both of you of actually course. how um, how long were you stuck in that depression mode for? Was it a year, six months? Was it no? no. Um, how long was, um, was was that sort of mental health? I would say, well, possibly around about six months to start months. with, because it was pre-COVID. This was 2019, before the uh, 2020 lockdown thing. So it was right before that, and I was starting to come out of it. But the depression that I had after that was not so much of the what happened to Sandra. But it's now what's happening to me. Now my life's been stopped. I can't do music. I can't do TV work. I can't do a thing. Because it made it sound like we were finished. So that's how I felt. And that that depressed me as well. So I had another, I think, six months on top of that. So probably all in all, eight months to a year of this depression thing, you know. And I was on the antidepressants for a while. And then I suffered from severe anxiety as well. I know about that. Uh, so I t- took meds for that, and I said, I'd still take those. Um, but I can go on a stage and I can sit with you and people like that. Yeah. But as soon as a situation you don't want to be involved is, I can panic. So I have to take these tablets beforehand, and I'm all right. You know, I'm, it's all under 
order sort of thing. Well, when know, I saw you out there earlier, like both of you, you, you just like you just wouldn't think it. No, that no. you both went through such a, a yeah. depressing time yeah. and a, a big thing. And you know, you're bubbly, you're up, te- you're upbeat, you're uplifting. I, I yeah. felt your vibe; it was an amazing vibe. Course, yeah. But then to hear this, I mean, because I'm quite shocked. You know, yeah. obviously that voice note, you don't hear much, but no. I'm quite shocked at what you've just said. And you know, it's yeah. like. It's mind blowing. Yeah, it is. And now you sit here today, and obviously you're telling your sides of the story to anyone out there yeah. sort of suffering as well. Um, I mean, these two are, are first hand; they, they know all about it. Yeah. You know, Deb, yeah. I want to sort of ask you a question, actually. Yes. Um, so, when um, Craig was going through all this kind of depression, mm-hmm. uh, he said eight to ten months. Yes. Um, were you following with him for that eight to ten months as well? Did it affect your lifestyle, your work? You know, everything, even. Yes. Uh, even like family life. Yes, um, basically I was finding that, um, you know, he wasn't speaking too much to me. Um, he was always in thought about his sister. And um, it's just one of these phases that you just have to let it go and write it out, you know, yeah. and uh, he'll reach the other end. So that's what basically happened. But I had to do the journey with him, oh. you know what I mean? Like yeah. the, the grief. I know Sandra wasn't my sister, but yeah. she she was my sister-in-law. Yeah. Mm. And I mean, I, I, I feel it too, you know? Yeah. So um, yeah, it's like the two, two of us had a shoulder to cry. We've, yeah, yeah. I've seen you through it. So that was the main thing that um, I didn't want to lose my husband oh, to God, grief, no, no, you know? No, no. But um, it, it turned out that, um, you know, these things, the, you, it's always there, Craig, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, but, mm. yeah, I believe that. Um, it's just, you just have to just um, basically let it go and talk about things. Yeah. I feel that people who are going through depres- depression must actually speak about things and yeah. that's the way to let See, that's it go. I can see yeah. in your face right now, there's yeah. a, like how much, you know, I could see that kind of... Oh, that that emotion, I, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That, those emotions behind your eyes. I yeah. could just see it right there mm-hmm. from what yeah. you know, Craig was going through. Yeah, um, I can feel it as well. It's almost like the vibe, mm-hmm. you know. So no. I, you know, but you know what? You add each other. Yeah. Um, so can I just ask? Are you both now in a good, good, happy place? Are you? Yeah. You know, are you? Yeah. I mean, you seem out there like you were. Less, you yes. things are going well yeah. for you. Got another TV thing you're doing. So yeah, which yeah. I cannot yeah. wait to watch. We're, by we're the way, in a good place. Yeah. so yes. you're in an amazing place. I'm doing some so, TV yes. stuff, which which we'll let everybody know in due course. And um, the, the, this this should help people who struggle through mental health as well, because if we can do it, and if Stevie can do it, you can do it as well. You can get out, you can inter- if you're not an entertainer, it doesn't matter. It just matters if you've got it up there to say to somebody, you know, if you need help, I'm here. I love you. It doesn't matter if you don't really love them as in a sexual way, but if your family, if you've got friends out there or somebody needs to speak to you, why not speak to them? Yeah, so Craig and Debs, how come, how can people get hold of you both? Um, yeah. You know, if they want to reach out to you both, if they're going through the same sort of thing, how can they reach out to you both? Well, they can get us on social media, Facebook under Craig and Debs CDS, or under the Z and Sapphire name. This is a Z and an S E double S. There we are. <laughs> <laughs> um, just in case you spell it wrong. Um, but um, yeah, you can get us there on on Facebook, um, on on Instagram, and um, and Twitter as well. All the social medias, all the oh. socials. And if you need any help and any you know advice, we're here for you, as as Stevie would be as well. You know. That's so. perfect. Have you got any like fi- uh, like final things you want to sort of say to to me or to the viewers? You know, because obviously this journey. For well, both of you is, uh, I mean, ugh, I'm still a little bit shocked actually. That's why I'm trying to sort of, yeah, yeah. you know, stay ahead of the game. But you yeah. too, I, it's just, it's really shocked me. Um, have you got sort of anything you want to add or say, you know? Do you want to add something and then I'll do it? I just think that um, always say I love you to your yeah. your loved ones. Absolutely. Yeah. Always say that uh, because you don't know when you're gonna kind of see them next time. Yeah. That's, that's it. And from me, I would say, remember, there's someone out there for everybody. There's always an ear there that will listen, and you are the mouth that we can speak. So work them together, they'll gel together, and you can make things happen. Good things can overcome mental health. For us, Sapphire, or Debbie, and Stevie as well. You know, we, we've all been there. Your journey can end, and it can end by speaking out.
Well, thank you so much for joining me today. My name has been Stevie Ritchie, and I've been joined by two amazing guests, Craig and Debs, AKA Zed and Sapphire. Thank you so much. Take care of yourselves, and don't forget, you are not alone. Please do speak out. Stay tuned for the next bit. I'll see you soon. Hi, welcome back. This is Mind Over Matter TV. I'm Fiona Watt, and I'm joined today by Daniel David Anderson, or you may remember him as MC Scandalous. Daniel, thank you so much for joining me here today. I am delighted to have you on the show. Thank you very much. And especially your willingness to speak about such a sensitive and personal yeah, yeah. topic. So we, when we kind of chatted a little bit in advance of the camera rolling about what areas of mental health we would talk about today, we just we came across so many topics, everything from growing up, obviously we've known each other since we were 18, yes. that's over 20 years ago now, yeah. working in the entertainment industry, relationships, failed relationships, family, yeah. childhood trauma, careers, addiction, sexuality, race, where do you want to start? I don't know, there's a checklist. Yeah, 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 yeah. wherever you want. Okay, so maybe a little background in information on what your involvement, experience, like what area of the entertainment industry did you work in or start oh, out um, in? the beginning, it was wanting to be a music producer. Mm -hmm. So MCing in Garage, yeah, Garage MCing, that was the first thing. Mm -hmm. Obviously as a child, you kind of want to be like Michael Jackson, all these other kind of artists. But in terms of me going, yeah, I can do that. That was Garage MC and Jungle MC. And then after which, I started to realise, wait, I need my own track. So that's what I, where well, I've got an interest in music production. Mm -hmm. Then met Robin, your cousin, yes. and that person, who I kind of regarded as a mentor around that time, taught me the process within, or, or what to know, or what I need to have in order to be a producer. And so that's that. the time when we met each other. Exactly, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. In a recording studio yeah, in yeah, South yeah. London. And what was really interesting was after 20 years, it was only today, from our conversation today, that you actually said that at that time you were not only suffering from anxiety, which I had no idea, mm -hmm. but also alopecia. Yes, yeah. yeah. And I had always thought you just wore your baseball cap because no, you yeah. liked wearing your baseball cap. And no, it was a nice cap. Yeah, 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 I never yeah. questioned it. Yeah, yeah. And for you to actually say, no, that was, you know, yeah, I, I yeah, was yeah. going through anxiety. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. losing my hair. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. was really stressed out. Yeah, yeah. And it really made me think, you can, you just don't know what people are going through. Yeah, and yeah. on the outside of it, yeah. I just saw, you know, my friend who was, ambitious, thought you were anything but anxious. Right, okay. Yeah. And that anxiety that you were experiencing at that time, you had, and if it's okay to disclose this, um, had been using weed as a way to cope with it. Yeah. For you, that became a gateway drug to... Yeah. What did you go on to after the weed? Oh, uh, well, many years after that, I said a good two decades, it was cocaine. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And your experience with cocaine, was it something recreational every now and then? Was it something you... Yeah, at the time, I think even when you're saying um, weed was a gateway drug, at the time it was, just a, it was just a drug. Everyone used it, so it was more of like a social thing for me at the time. And then the addiction side of weed was realising, wait there, I need to draw everywhere I go, whether mm -hmm. it's studio, to mate's house, whatever. But the gateway thing was more like, well, I guess that's what the topic of the, the thing is, mental health. Yes. So there's a gap in my understanding of what I was going through emotionally. That was the gateway to the drug, which was cocaine, that made me feel at ease with the problems I was going through at the time. And that's you identifying that now as a grown man on yes. a healing journey, yeah, yeah. going through a recovery process. Yeah. At the time, if you can recall, obviously your judgment was clouded back then under the influence. Yeah. What was your thought process when you were actually engaging in regular cocaine use? Exactly, to numb the feeling. That, numb had, the yeah, feeling. that was it, yeah, yeah. And when you say the feeling, what? Um, the feeling of, okay, anxiety, um, I don't know, self-pity, um, self, what do you call it, self-sabotage, anything that I didn't like the feeling of. Okay. 
And, I, and, and the thing is, at the time, it's not that cocaine made me feel better, it just didn't make me feel those things. Did it numb for you your thoughts and emotions? Or? Over time it did, yeah, definitely. But at that time, it just, it kind of like took away those feelings as I thought, so I thought anyway. And how did your addiction affect your life? Physically, oh, yeah. emotionally, mentally, your relationships, did it have any effect or impact on those things? I don't think things? you've got enough time for me to explain it, but let's just say um, from using, uh, for using that specific job for eight years, it got to the point where my life was like not a life that I wanted to live. Not in the terms of a suicidal uh, way, but mm -hmm. in terms of I didn't recognise who I was and neither did the people around me, okay. if that makes sense. Could you put that into a very stark contrast for me? So I will date stamp it mm. um, around, um, around 1999 mm. to 2000. Mm. We are late teens, you know, heading towards early 20s. I know you as a very ambitious, logical, calm person. Put that into contrast then when you're in your early 30s and you have your cocaine addiction. Can you give me the comparisons of I mean, I how, how, when you say your life changed, yeah. how did it affect your finances? Well, I, your, yeah, well, of course it, yeah. Relationships? It, yeah, yeah, definitely, because any, the effect of anything that's out of control will affect those things. But I could be, I could be sarcastic and say I was still ambitious, I was still calm, and I was still whatever the other thing is, just for a different cause. You see what I mean? I was very ambitious, ambitious sorry, when it came to finding money for the drug. Very creative. How did you finance that addiction? Through through my trade. So I'm a decorator by trade. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it was just me just spending all of my wages on that drug, and then the creative side was talking people that would, you know, have that on them, into giving it to me, do you see what I mean? So okay. basically, what I'm trying to explain is, I don't think my personality changed that much, it was just, it, I don't know, because that's a really good question actually. I just think, I think what you're trying to ask is, how, how would you have known the difference between you then and you, you afterwards or, or when you were using it, but with that drug being the effect and I guess it was just like, uh, oh shit, sorry. Um, I, don't know, I think I just lost, I, lo I lost any kind of self-esteem. That's it, self-esteem. So I didn't have much of that. Do you think that's a really clear differentiating factor to somebody who uses drugs recreationally, which I'm not condoning, yeah. I'm also not judging, but yeah. certainly at the time we were in our late teens and early 20s, mm -hmm. it was something that really was common practice. I mean, experiment, experimenting is quite a standard part of growing up yeah again not condoning drug use yeah. but it wouldn't be out of the norm certainly back then mm -hmm. for people to experiment with drugs yeah. but do you think your anxiety your mental health challenges yeah. and i want to be very clear we're talking mental health not mental illness so we're not talking about a clinical condition mm -hmm. we are talking about challenges that everybody faces in every walk of life, life regardless of what the trigger of those challenges are. Yeah, um, mm, yeah but the, I hear what you're saying, but if you haven't, like, if you don't have stable, men, if your mental health is at jeopardy, or it's being like, generally it's not nurtured, then it leads on to a mental illness. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, well for me it did, it's the same kind of thing. When you, when you use cocaine, you go into like um, psychosis, drug-induced psychosis. Really? Okay. Well, yeah. Oh, okay, right, sorry, yeah, I'm just, I feel like I'm in a therapy session, but yeah. No, yeah, so that's what happens. Lack of sleep, um, the amount you use, and I, I do want to point out, now the thing is, and I learned this through my, the program I'm in, not everybody that uses any type of mind or substance has the, the consequences I suffered or many other addicts suffer. It's just, what I realised is, those things weren't for me. You see what I mean? I needed to deal with my problems or my issues or my situation. Did it affect your health? What were the health implications of being addicted to cocaine? Do you know what? It's so weird. So I'm, I, yeah, I'm listening to these questions as if to say, wasn't it obvious? But I, I'm forgetting that, yeah, people don't know, I know you. So yeah, my health, yeah, it was, it was unbelievable. Um, I don't know, like, uh, my immune system was weakened. So with, um, with alopecia, it's an autoimmune disease, right? So mm -hmm. I didn't help the matter by staying up for three days. Okay. I didn't help the matter by not eating healthily. Mm -hmm. Didn't help the matter by worrying, internal stress, like you say, anxiety, worrying about the outcome of certain things. So yeah, the way I reacted to that drug 
was the reaction of somebody that should not be taking it, whether it's recreational or whether it's to help something. Were your or, family and friends aware of your addiction? You know what, nah, they weren't aware of the addiction, no. Using, yeah, but the addiction, no. Do you see what I mean? And I say that with a difference because using is one thing, everyone kind of assumed, okay, you didn't have that many life consequences with weed, so I'm guessing, and that's just down to them being not educated in addiction, mm -hmm. and myself as well. I was like, okay, I guess it's like the weed, you'll do it now and again, you'll be all right. Friends, like I was saying to the car, it, it isolated me, so my friends didn't really know. Even now, like when I tell them, no, 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 really. Mm -hmm. So I have to really explain to them and go into it. But yeah, no, it wasn't, it wasn't something that was... And what difference has it made speaking to other people about it? How has that helped your recovery? I mean, certainly we hadn't spoken mm -hmm. in a long time. Yeah. And when we did speak, I had no idea that that's what you were going through right, and yeah, it really yeah. shocked me that mm. you were experiencing that yeah, and yeah, yeah. that I had through, I mean, you know, I don't believe coincidence, but yeah, I, ha I had um, reached out at a time that you were at what you described really as being one of your lowest points. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely, yeah. Um, but, okay, to answer your question, if I remember it, how does it help me talking about it? Is that yeah, what, talking and being in a recovery process, oh, a recovery listen, program, yeah, know, it's receiving brilliant. therapy. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. What's changed for you since you started the recovery process? Well, I mean, I could be again like cynical and say I've changed. You know I mean, but mm -hmm. my perspective has okay. changed. Um, me not, uh, yeah, looking back at the past or my past decisions and actions with any regret. You see know what I mean? Self pity. Mm -hmm. So a lot's changed, man. I've matured. Yeah. with regards to looking at what I went through and how not to go through that anymore. But at the same time, it's easier to talk to people that are going through that. You yes. know what I mean? And learning from people that are going through that. What have been the biggest triggers for you for your mental health? The biggest triggers is not being comfortable with the feelings I have day to day. Okay. Is that something, is that how you've always felt? Do you remember growing up feeling like that or something? That's, that's how everyone nature? feels, like human beings. Yeah. But they, everyone deals with it different. So my way of dealing with it was to use my not with substances like weed, alcohol or cocaine mm -hmm. to, to kind of forget that feeling and not deal with that feeling. Other people I've noticed through conversation and talking to them and just being advised by them, they deal with the feeling. Okay. So if they're going through grief, they cry. If they're going through embarrassment, they feel what makes them embarrassed and try and change the situation they're in. With me, if I go through grief or if I went through grief, I would take a substance that makes me go, what grief? And then if I was okay. to be embarrassed, it would be like, well, I don't really care about that anyway. As Do you a, still approach it like that now? No, no. So thankfully, being in a, a recovery program, general one, and just, just kind of like understanding myself a bit more, trying to, mm -hmm. I identify the feeling and I go, okay, that's what that feels like. And through advice and through just kind of better understanding of human beings, I go, okay, cool. Has that support structure and professional advice been the catalyst for you to healing and recovering? Yes, they've been. Yeah, it's been the main reason, I guess. Yeah, okay. yeah. That's that's wonderful to yeah. hear. It, it really, really is. I think oh, right. for a lot of people, myself included, because of the times we grew up in, the idea of going through therapy was almost like an admission that there's something wrong, yeah. which, you know, in this day and age, it's really silly to not admit that you're not okay, that you're facing challenges, because everybody does. Yeah, and that's the thing. So with me, I never used to want to admit that. I didn't even want to ask for help if I was in school. Now I go, well, okay, if I'm angry, how do I stop being angry? Mm -hmm. And I ask that to a person that's got experience of getting over anger without changing themselves, you know yes, what I mean? Yeah. And then I listen to that person, that's it. I don't always listen to myself, which yeah. is what I've been for years. You know? As well as talking to people, what other things do you do to help your mental health? Do you oh, exercise? Meditation, yeah, meditation, meditation okay. exercise, I go to the gym, um, I try and eat healthy. And this is all based upon advice, so I'm in that process of trial. That's what I mean? to the show. My name is Lisa and today we have here the lovely Jane Buckle. Jane will be speaking about her past and the mental health issues that she has overcome and where she is today, which is UK's Naughtiest OAP. So Jane, thank you very much for coming along today and 
We can see you've brought some lovely photos. Would you like to talk us through who they are, um, what they mean to you, any battles that you might have overcome, you know, surrounding right. your family life? I will, okay. As you know, I'm Jane Buckle, aka Janie B, not Jerry P. But I wasn't always a happy little soul because all of my family, basically, except for my brother there, these people are all dead. There's I'm my sorry. father, Frank John Buckle, yeah. and my mother, and this, these, this was taken back in the 1950s, probably the year I, before I was born. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll explain who each one is. This one's my husband. Do you want to just lift it up yeah. so the audience yeah. can yeah. see? Yeah. yeah. Frank Stockwell. They're all sadly gone. That's granddaddy. Granddad, Harold, Clarence, Redvers, Skinner, right? Now, this one is all the family, everyone in the family. Daddy, Frank John Buckle, Nanny, Lillian Helen Gray Skinner, my brother, Jonathan Buckle, June Wendy Buckle, and of course, me, people, right? And then the last one, is my father, Frank John Buckle, with his racehorse, John the Greek. Right, when I'm going to talk about them... Can I just ask, how old was your brother when he passed away? Sorry, uh, my husband, he was... Oh, sorry, um, Let me husband. think, one minute. Um, 2011, he would have been about 75. He was quite a lot older than me. Okay, and yeah. I believe that you did some caring for him, did you? Not or so much him, father. but for my father in his later years because in 2014 I had to go and live with him because he, he had Parkinson's oh and it was all a very, I stayed with him, I didn't put him in a nursing home, I just couldn't do it. But <clears throat> the day he died in, in 2014 it was quite quite awful because mm. he was meant to go to hospital and um, he didn't go, he had a funny turn, it was awful. He couldn't breathe and he died. We tried to resuscitate him, but it didn't work. Anyway, it was all very grim and I was left on my own in the house, in the bungalow. And I went to bed, obviously I couldn't sleep bro, when I heard a bang on the door, bang, bang, bang. And I think my father came back. He really? was in the land of the limbos. He was not sure and he wondered where we all were. Anyway, eventually, I went to the hospital because he died with his mouth open. I went to the mortuary to so sew my dad's mouth shut. But he said, no, no, you can't come in. Anyway, after that, I had to clear the house out, do everything on my own. And I did have a lovely funeral service for him, but it took me three weeks to organise it. Wow. And the day I went to view his body in the funeral parlour, I didn't really want to go. It was all horrible. And because I'm so short, they put me on a chair and I nearly fell in with him. Oh, Joe. He, he would have liked that. But it was a, it was terrible because I always had my dad always with me. Yeah. And um, now he's at the cemetery. They all are. And I go and visit them a lot. But probably the worst one that died was my mother mm. in 1995 because she had a, a brain hemorrhage. Oh, dear. And she ended up in hospital and they were going to put a coil through like a stent into the brain, mm. but it, it didn't work. She was having vasospasms. spasms. And how old was she? 62. Very anyway, long. the day of the operation, you see, I never left my mother's side. We were like that. We were like sisters. She's only 21 years older than me. I went down in the lift with her to the operating theatre. Mm -hmm. And on the way down, you're not really meant to go that far with her. I would have gone in there with her, you know, said to me, oh dear, this is awful. He said, I'm not going to die, am I, Jane? And I said, no, Mum. But they were all, she was always reliant on me. I think she thought I could save her, but I couldn't. So afterwards, I had this thing in my head. It was like a tape recording. I'm not going to die, Jane. I'm not going to die. And it went on and on and on and on. But luckily, I was with my brother. Anyway, they're together at the cemetery. But oh dear, it was awful, all the whole, the whole episode. And then the dear husband died. In 2011, Sorry. he had cancer. And how old was he? He's about, what did I say, 75. He's quite a lot older than me. But it's all it's been... still young, though, 75. Yeah, it's all been a bit uh, traumatic. Yeah. Um, 
And how did you, obviously, you know, that's a lot of stress for you to go through. Yeah, yeah. Um, how did it affect you emotionally, mentally? Yeah. Well, I became very introverted and subdued. But luckily for me, I had the benefit of seeing a counsellor, a bereavement counsellor. And did you find that help? Yeah, and he helped me through it. Mm -hmm. And he said, you must try and find something in your life because your mum and dad, your dad always said, you're very funny, get out there and entertain people. So that's when I started to embrace life, to do mm -hmm. films, comedy, entertainment, all of that. And of course, altogether Tavern, which I'm very proud to be in. I'm the mother of Margie yeah. and you know it's kept me occupied but you do need a hobby otherwise you will lapse into the depths of yeah. despair and that is not a nice place. So anyone be. going through bereavement you would recommend them seeing a bereavement counsellor counselor. Yeah. and yeah. obviously you know looking at Jane now and what she's achieving in her acting career, um, reality TV, uh, been on many many shows it does show you that, you know, finding a hobby, if you are going through, not just through bereavement, any mental health issue, just find something that you can focus on and, you know, see a way out of that cloud that you're in. Reach out for help. So Jane, you touched upon you go to the cemetery um, a lot. How frequent do you, um, you know, go there and how do you find that it affects you mentally? Does it cause you um, to be upset? Does it help you grieve? Um, if you want to speak a little yeah. bit about that. Well, I do go up the cemetery a lot, probably two or three times a week. And in lockdown, I was up there every day. It's really lovely. But I go up to see my mum and dad, as you can see, right? And they are together. And grandfather. And where's the granny? Granny's there. But the thing about it up there, it's very, very tranquil mm -hmm. and it's very relaxing. And I'm sure they can hear me. Well, I think oh, yes, they can. Definitely. But the thing was up there, I was on the council for a very short time. And then my stepmom died, I had to leave. But when I was up there, I was having, at that time, I was having nightmares about jumping over open graves, okay? Oh, yeah. And I put two and two together, and it was the paupers were up there, mm. but no one had recognised they were there. There were just these big dips in the ground where the coffins had gone in and they'd sunk. And they were feeling very miserable, I could tell. So when I was on the council, I got a big stone put up in a plaque. And it says on there, in memory of the workhouse, so I think it was nine, 18, something over the 14, 8 to 1940. And there's thousands buried there. Mm -hmm. And since I had the plaque put up and the statue, I haven't had any more bad dreams. Really? And are you spiritual as a person? Well, I, I think it showed me in a way, that time mm -hmm. when my, I thought my dad was banging on my bedroom door yeah. and that. And because I resolved it and got a plaque put up, and everything is all right now. That's really um, sweet of you well, to do that. I like doing that, yeah, mm. yeah. But it, it does help going to the cemetery. Well, thank you very much, Jane, for coming along today, you know, and speaking about your past, bringing your lovely photos to show us. And, you know, really for being that inspiration for anybody going through mental health. Um, so thank you very, very much. It's been thank an absolute you. pleasure. And the pleasure you. is all mine. Thank you so much. Okay. And thank you very much for watching. I'm Lisa and this is Jane Buckle, UK's naughtiest OAP. Good afternoon, I'm Anne and today I have here with me Mr. Elias Hedgekemes. Brussels-based Cyberot. It's a senior European advisor on security and defense also member to the Inter um, International Institute for Strategic Study of London, UK. Currently he works for Union European. Today we will have a little conversation about mental health importance. You are welcome. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. I would like to thank you for inviting me to your TV show and for giving me the opportunity to contribute to the discussion on this important topic. How are you maintaining your mental health every day being a very busy person with a lot of responsibilities? 
Well, I think um, that um, um, there are two main, main things that contribute to that. First, what I do for myself. And the second is my, the conditions, the situation in my working environment. On the first, I, um, I've managed to have a, a routine. And when you have a routine, it helps you um, have less stress and less anxiety to, uh, to have some more time for yourself. Um, have some habits like um, uh, sleep better, eat uh, healthier, uh, be active, um, uh, do some sports and so on. So I have this routine, I interact with people, I communicate with family, this helps a lot. I go out with friends. So uh, this helps me maintaining my mental health. In my working environment, uh, I mean, it's, it's very good working environment, uh, financial security, I mean, there are clear tasks, motivation, there is a recognition of the work, um, professionals uh, working with me. So I think this has all also helped in, uh, in maintaining my, uh, my mental health. Um, it's an environment at work where there are no, let's say, discrimination, there is no in in inequalities. So all this, I think, um, contributes to having uh, a good mental health or, or have less risk in, uh, to my mental health. So what I see often is that the personal life, the private life and the work life it's like communicating uh, vessels. I don't know if you are familiar with this term, I mean, physics. I mean, if you have balance in one, most likely you're gonna have balance in the other as well. Well, while if you don't have balance in one, you don't have balance to the other. So um, I think at this um, stage, I have balance in, in, in both. That's very interesting. <laughs> it's good to know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I have another question. It's about, do you think we have to give much more attention to our mental health from childhood to till adulthood? Uh, definitely, definitely. Um, there is a, in my head, there is a difference. Um, in, while in the adulthood, we are responsible, more or less, to do what's needed for ourselves to maintain our mental health. So it's really important to do so. And if we cannot manage ourselves, we should seek for help. In, in our childhood, it's, 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 the difference is that somebody else has to do that for us. So either the family or uh, guardians or parents, they should be doing that for the child. And they should not expose the child into um, uh, difficult situations like fighting, or anything that causes a drama, okay? So my point is that definitely it's important to maintain a mental health from childhood to adulthood. But the main difference is that in adulthood we can do, we should be doing uh, what's needed to maintain that, while in the childhood it's somebody else's responsibility. Normally it's somebody else's responsibility, okay? Because subconsciously, in childhood, some of these things, I mean, may, may um, uh, cause, have, have implications in the future. So that's, that's what I believe um, is the situation. That's, that's, that's true. Mm -hmm. I agree with this. And do you think uh, that many people, they are still ashamed or, I don't know, hiding? not preferring to talk about uh, mental health problems? Well, shame is, uh, is a strong word. It's, it's, it's a hard, it's, it's, it's a painful uh, situation, uh, which for sure sometimes le leads to loneliness and depression. Um, shame um, comes from what, uh, on, uh, from how we perceived ourselves or how do we think that others uh, have the perception that others have for us and this is really hard I mean um, uh, there are people that um, uh, think about it and um, uh, it's, it's not it's really negative okay 
and uh, you know i mean the when you face problems um, or you feel like there's a problem with your mental health you don't easily go out and uh, you don't easily share with others because you're going to be thinking probably that you're going to be uh, mocked or you're going to be i don't know um, considered as a as a lunatic or being a, a strange person um, so yes shame it's a really a situation where um, people need help to deal with. Uh, you need to improve your self-awareness. You need to identify the source of your of your shame, and um, to the extent that this is necessary, you need to seek for help. Yeah, definitely that's true. And don't they have to deal with this and stop thinking like the, someone will judge us for this? So I agree with this. Yeah, we had this. Uh, we had this. We, people tend to hide it because they don't want to be perceived as psychos, yeah. which is a normal situation. It could happen to anyone, right? Yeah. And uh, I mean, just ju just imagine um, where the, for, for in, in particular moments in time, I mean, even in the recent past, like in the COVID situation, I mean, more people had issues, okay? Yeah. Um, now, even with the situation in Ukraine, more people, this causes, um, this situation causes people I mean, this is insecurity, yeah. uh, this fear may bring a lot of people in the situation. So in, in, this, uh, in these cases, you need to seek help. And also, what I would like to say is that the, if you identify that there is a problem with your mental health, or, there is, or, or you think that you need to change something, this cannot happen overnight. First of all, you have to do it step by step. Set a goal, one goal, second goal, third goal. Uh, it, it doesn't happen overnight. The second thing is that you need to plan, okay? So you need to plan um, so that whatever you apply in your life, whatever changes you're making, to be consistent and coherent, okay? Not to, not, to, not to change that tomorrow or the day after. So you need to plan. And um, this is really important. And, I think, I think from my experience, having seen people in the situation, I think that you need to reshape a little bit about, uh, about your, uh, reshape the, your thinking. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there, you don't have to change completely your life when you identify that you have some issues. Uh, step by step, plan your steps, be consistent, be coherent, achieve little goals, and I think it's, you're gonna manage. Yeah, you mentioned about the Ukraine and I am from Moldova, so I remember when this started, how it affected me because I have family there. So I'm still um, thinking about them, if something will get worse, what's going to happen. And I'm always thinking about my mom, my sister, my brother, because I have a lot of member family there. So another reason. You're right, you're right. I mean, um, there is a tendency, I mean, uh, where in these uh, shocks, when we have these shocks, um, the first thing we do is to look at the economy. But uh, eventually, there are implications also to the, to the so social uh, well-being, okay? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think that uh, it's natural, um, under certain circumstances, people to find themselves in this situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are losing their job. I mean, financial insecurity is a big issue. Fear of unemployment, it's a, it's a problem. Another one. So, I mean, this, these are, uh, I think that under certain circumstances, people may need help and they should seek help from, uh, from friends, from family, or from experts. Yeah, to ask before it's gonna be too late. Yeah, to start. I mean, for sure. For yeah. Sure. So, do you think the men are less subject to being affected of mental health disease? Mm, no, I think um, it's, uh, it's the same. Uh, for all people, it's the same. Uh, what happens normally with uh, men, I mean, since they are, ever since, ever, they were, even when they are um, young boys, they learn not to, I mean, to tolerate pain and don't cry. Uh, because crying is, um, let's say, a sign of weakness, mm -hmm. and they believe that they, if they, they should be, they should appear strong. So um, the chances are that they will not admit it, uh, because that will be against the the model and the and the culture uh, that they grew up with. Mm -hmm. But I think that all people 
have the same chances in, uh, in getting in this situation. Yeah, there's no one that's secure of this. It uh, has been my pleasure to have you here today. And thank you very much for accepting my invitation. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure for me as well. Hello everyone, I'm Ricky and today we have a very beautiful Duchess Leticia. Hiya! So Duchess, um, I want to talk, before we go forward, I want to talk about this name Duchess Leticia. It looks very exclusive to me. Mm. It looks, um, you know, <laughs> sound so fascinating and interesting. I just want to talk about your name first before we move forward to the episode. Mm. Well, it was kind of one of these things where I wanted to be within my higher consciousness. Yeah. So within that, it was like, okay, I need to do what I can physically. And physically, <coughs> it was like, okay, I'm going to change my title because it was like, you know, a lot more effort to try to get a doctor. I did change one to that. I've got yeah. a certificate that does say that. Yeah. But, so, <laughs> Megan was also a part inspiration too. Yes. And I looked, I was like, you can't actually register your name as Queen unless that would be as an yeah. alias name such. So, mm. Duchess was the second highest one. So, what okay. other names you got? Oh, I've got Letitia Antoinette. Yeah. Um, that's with my um, branding name, but also that's my first two names. Yes. And also Madame Kapuscinska. Madame Cap of, ooh, I can't say that, but that <laughs> looks, <laughs> that sounds so exclusive, you know. So, Letitia. She's entrepreneur, artist, production, um, any talent, full of talent, you know. Let's talk about what you actually are. You are you are production, you know, you got all this talent that got into you and yeah. there's some faces where Leticia you've been struggling mentally. Yeah. And we're gonna talk about that today. And first of all I really like to thank Leticia for coming to show. Only reason is take courage. It's take courage for people who struggle with mental health to come out and talk about it. So I really appreciate you coming out there. I'll just tell something about us, uh, about yourself, you know, uh, how do you get a journey? How does everything start? And then how do you get from that stage where you feel like nothing, everything is over to become a different version of yourself, you know? Tell us something about yourself, like how do you start, like what happened? Well, I would say, um, in a sense, I'm a serial entrepreneur mm. with the multitude of different things that I do. Um, it started more so within the journey of songwriting wow. and as an artist. Mm. So I'd be singing, songwriting, performing, um, some music directing and performance coaching. Wow. And I also had um, was running my own record label. Mm. and. Um, Generally, I found that music tends to be a medicine in a sense mm. because it's the words and feelings and emotions and stuff that you feel. And instead of being able to just talk to somebody about it, yes. it's either okay, I'll record, I'll let out how I'm feeling. And then sometimes, at, at times, it has been that I've had two odd fans that have come out and said to me, I was like, that song saved my soul. And I was just yes. like, wow. I was like, well, it <laughs> saved me too. Yeah. Because it lifted me out of it. So. so what's that one song that's your go-to song? Every time you feel like, you know, we, it's happened to all of us, guys. Mm -hmm. If you're listening to this, it's happened to all of us. Where the, face, the, the one face will come where we all feel like we are right in a death and somebody will pull us up. Mm -hmm. It might be a song, person, you know, situation. So let's talk about that one song that always pull you up. Yeah, yeah, this is me. I'm, I'm out of it this now. Well, I found that in a sense, some of my songs are literally me talking back at myself wow. as well. And um, I would say Little Star. Damn. Um, that's one of my songs that I wrote for um, my children. I wrote that because it was just like, what if I wasn't there? Mm -hmm. How, you know, how can I reach out to them? Mm -hmm. So that was a song of me watching over them and stuff, if I had ever passed sort of thing, watching them through the different stages in their life. So I found, I think that song is a reminder that it's just like, you've 
got them. Got them. You know, so Sweet. they are my little stars, and I've got to be a little star too. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, so in in life, yeah, uh, that's my own experience. There are some motivators in your life mm-hmm. that pull you through. Yeah, my motivator is my mum. She pulls me up like so bad. Like, I want to do big things in my life. Like for family, it's big things. Having a children that help you to yeah. go out of that phase, they are your motivator. You know, I know you're getting a bit emotional <laughs> yeah. now. It's good. It's good to get the emotions out. You know, sometimes it's good to get your emotion out. But then this is also looking backward, the way you was before, mm. and now where you at now. Mm-hmm. You know, you are a completely different person. You look adorable today, you know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um, I, I just, uh, you told me you also a book writer as well. So tell, tell us something about that book you wrote about. So I wrote, um, my first book is called um, My Mind's Eye and See You Soon Angel. So it's like two sorts of messages in there. Um, the mind's eye is literally the way the book has been captured in how I've expressed myself is literally how my mind's been scattered in the past and how I'd be taking in different information from one extreme to this extreme to this feeling to that feeling. Mm. So that um, I also have dyslexia and my other wow. mental health stuff. So usually whenever you'd go and get a book, you're always going to see it's perfect, it's so professional, you can't see nothing wrong, mm. sort of thing. It's an easy read. So I was mm. like, no, no, no. I said, I want to capture the truthness of yeah. me. That's like, I don't come out as clear mm. as at times that is comprehensible for everybody. Yes. But then those that understand, they understand. Mm. It's like, I know what she's saying, I know what she's saying. So I was <laughs> like, I'm not going to change it. Mm. So finding out that process mm. was exciting. but. I, also work on the second one. Um, you also said you have a clothing line as well, you know. Let, t- tell us about that. All this talent in one girl. <laughs> All this talent in one girl. So this is, God, this is true encouraging, true motivator here for everybody out there who's struggling with mental health, struggle with all these, you know, faces and situation where they feel like they have no one right there. Letitia is one of the example right there. So guys, do hear her very well. So tell, tell us about your clothing line. So, so um, clothing line is um, Letitia Antoinette. So it was literally, um, one day I was just thinking to myself, I was like, all oh, these big brands. I was like, they're so expensive. I was like, I can't afford this one or this one. I ain't saying all the different names and stuff like mm. this, but you know the names of the <laughs> yeah. brand, yeah? So um, I thought to myself, I was like, let me start my story. Yes. Like, what does my name mean? Mm. So, Letitia Antoinette means mm. to bring joy beyond wow. praise. So I thought, yes. So if I can learn to bring joy beyond praise mm. in my own life, maybe those that get connected with my clothing, mm. other parts, just with me, with my name yeah. that's connected to that, maybe they might also learn to be able yes. to bring joy beyond praise in their own lives. Yeah. And it's not about, oh, it's the price yes. of this. It's like, yes. I'm wearing a t-shirt and Antoinette, and, you mm. know, sort of, I'm feeling good within myself. Yes. And it's trying to spread that feeling for people to be feeling good within themselves. I could actually relate with that, guys, because I've got a clothing line as well. Um, it's on Instagram, guys. Go check it. It's at Dream and Resilience. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's amazing, you know. Um, um, what else? You, what What are your coping mechanism like? How do you like? How do you explain to your audience? Uh, what, what do you would? What What um, one One like coping mechanism would you tell us like today? Coping mechanisms. Well, I have gone through a lot of different strategies um, and interventions as a means to cope with my mental health, yeah. from hospitalizations, from different types of medications, and everything mm. as a guinea pig, um, through CBT therapy, from journaling to music. So I have bipolar and mm. also have ADHD, mm. um, autism and dyslexia. So one of my things is I can go into episode that I am really, really hyper. Hyper. Really hyper. Yeah. And just so you see, I was like, I am elated. Yeah. Just 
How can I say it? I guess it's like, well, she seems like you're really high. I was like, she's not even high on anything, yeah, yeah, yeah. but she's just literally yeah. really hyper. And so it gets an overload of energy that maybe it's to the point I might not sleep for a few days mm. or stuff. But you get fueled with so much energy that it's like you've got to dance, you've got to exercise, yeah. everything to keep you I, I can I can completely relate with those of you guys who don't know SDSD is something, deficiency that keeps you hyper all the time so you have uh, problems like your senses are always high it could be anything um, it could be anything the room environment is no good the clutterness in the room that could keep you high mm. um, so I understand that very well because I'm a, I'm a teacher as well with especially special children yeah. um, and those was you know have the ADSD, ADSD all them so I understand you know having that old severe sensory difficulties and you still manage to put yourself out there mm. by having such a talent out there um you're like you go clothing brand mm. you know are you a model as well yeah are you a model as well yeah well it's where is it i'm i became mrs Le i came third for mrs legend and i was representing um saint lucia and guyana so that yes was... all those men modeling <laughs> agency you need to sign Leticia, Duchess Leticia, right here. Yeah, so, what, um, oh, just now, so, um, we have your book here. Mm -hmm. It's called My Mind's Eye, Leticia. I am so hard. I can't, I can't <laughs> pronounce them. So <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> See you, Angel. <laughs> so, this is a book, guys, if you want to have a look. Right there. So, yeah, what's, um, what do you, you want to say that one thing that anybody who's reading this book will get out of it? One thing, it will get to the point of um, self-acceptance of literally, at times, you can't see yourself. So I had to put this book mm. out there for me to be able to see myself. That's true. So at times, maybe... I rush in, sometimes yeah. I can be irrational, mm. sometimes it's like, yes, I can get excited and be yeah. but it's my presentation at times mm. of things can appear messy. Yeah. So it's just like, okay, the scattered mind. Now I've captured how the scattered mind is. Yeah. I've owned that, I see how it is, mm. I recognise that. Let me be even better than what I have been. Yes, guys, please don't forget to check the book. Uh, it's called My My Mind's I, Leticia Capitine. If I pronounce it right, Leticia Capuchins. Capuchins, I do. I do apologize. As I'm just gonna call you Duchess Leticia okay. because I really like that name. Um, is there anything would you like to share with us today? Um, yes, they what? can find the book available on Amazon. Yep. Um, the website is still being made at the moment, but they will be able to find some of the products. The latest line is Let and Love. This is a collaboration yep. of the lip glosses and also some of my handbags. Wow. <laughs> handbag. Your lip <laughs> so guys, this is this is a handbag that Leticia's brand is there and she got some nice goodies. So don't waste no time. Go get the grabs before it goes away. <laughs> Let's see go. Um thank you. thank you very much for today. I do really appreciate you coming out, you know, sharing your experience with us. Um it's not it's not just sharing it, it's getting more people out of that zone those people are still in that phase where they're thinking there's nothing else they can't come out of it so it's for all you people those who thinks there's um, there's no other way to come out of it this is a way we can come out of it come out talk to people get help and there's a people who wants to help you like someone is a Leticia is pure uh, example sitting right of us come out of nowhere and then full of talent you know artists production company you know book writer name one she got all so <laughs> thank you very much for today and thank you Leticia for coming in today thank you, for having thank you. Me. Hi, this is Nads on Mind of a Matter. Today, I have a guest, it's Regine Samuel, and we're going to be talking about schizophrenia. So first of all, Regine, welcome to the show. Hey, Nads. How are you doing? I'm good. Uh, you're still smiling, considering you've practically taken all forms of transport to get here, apart from airplane and boat. 
So originally, you know, when you think of schizophrenia, there's a lot of stigma attached to it and people have their own kind of perceptions of it. So before we kind of delve a little bit more deeper into that, could you tell me how you sort of came to realize that this is something that's, that, you're kind, that you have, that you're kind of learning to live with? Yeah, um, so basically when I was like seven, I'll say from seven, um, I start, I, I could say it in like the simplest form, I used to go out in the back garden at all hours of the night yeah. and just start talking to air. And my dad one day happened to just look outside the window and notice like, what the hell? So he's gone downstairs and he said, who are you talking to? I am talking to my friend. Right. He's monitored this for a couple of weeks and then because he has it, he's like, okay. He could recognize it. the signs yeah. basically. Yeah. But because at seven years old, I'm too early to get diagnosed officially, I had had to wait till like I was 13 to get tested again. Then one more time at 16 and that's when they initially just said, yep, yeah, it's that. How did you go about sort of uh, dealing with it then? I mean, was it a case of going to the doctors for a consultation or? It was the doctor, so it was a talk with my dad first. Yeah. Trying to make me, like obviously I was young, so trying to make me understand it's nothing to be worried about, you're fine, which in truth I am. Yeah. Um, and then the doctor's obviously speaking to my parents, not really me, just asking me general questions like, what do you hear? Do you see this? Do you smell things that aren't there? Do you taste things that aren't there? That's it really. What exactly is schizophrenia then? <laughs> I could say it's like a really... If you ask different people, it's different things. Yeah. But realistically, the proper term is you hear, you see, smell, taste. You could even think that you're, like you delude yourself sometimes, so it's like delusions as well. Um, I'd say it sometimes has like a mood imbalance at times. Yeah. What I would call it, I mean, the doctors would call it, this is a psychotic, like mental health thing. So it's, it's built on psychosis, but I feel like it just makes people who have this, I feel like more, I won't say more special, but they, they have their own kind of understanding of the world. Yeah. And that could be good, that could be bad. It depends on like, if you went through trauma, if you like, it could literally just come from even drug use, it's so bad. Yeah. But even that, drug users could get it and sometimes it depends on what they was feeling in that moment. So if they overdo it on, let's say, a psychedelic, they might think of nice, happy things and they'll just always think of like... Those kind of yeah. things, yeah. yeah. Which I, most of the time, half and half, I'll have bad ones, but the bad ones don't really overtake the good ones I have, but yeah. then I've had a bad childhood. Yeah. And I've had trauma throughout my whole life, but I kind of built this world when I was seven to kind of make myself out of this bad world because I had two parents that weren't seen eye to eye. So it's escapism, so, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah really. And, and w once you'd kind of established what the situation was, how did you feel? I mean, how did it make you feel? Because again, it's the stigma attached to schizophrenia. So how did you feel? I feel like the stigma is quite dangerous, actually, because if you watch, I don't know if, if you guys watch films like Split, yeah, and I've seen it, yeah. They say that's based on schizophrenia. That's not schizophrenia. It's just film, that Bolly is Hollywood. A, that is a whole different yeah. disorder. That's DID, that's a disassociation disorder. So you are bound to have many personality, which is, which is a myth about yeah. schizophrenia. We have yeah. many personalities. Do you think it's almost kind of glamorized then, really? It is, it is, it's really bad. But what I will say, I feel like there's, there's a stigma, but people kind of let it go past their head that they can get this stigma and kind of just you don't always need to believe in you know the things you see in the films that you're not gonna be it's like you see certain things in films you're not gonna believe that, that this has happened yeah you know yeah. what i mean so why do we believe things like split and all these other f i think it's an american what's his name is it american psycho american something? psycho yeah yeah. That as well. Yeah. That has nothing to do. He's just 
who's just mad. So, yeah, it's, it's a lot to unpack. But how have you kind of learned to live with it then? I mean, how do you balance your, your normal life? I mean, with, with this? I mean, when I say when I was in my teens, I didn't deal with it very well. I did take a lot of like recreational drugs. I did a lot of alcoholism and I was in a lot of like bad environmental kind of situations. So I had bad friends, I had bad situations going on. I had a lot of anger within me. I think it's when I turned about 20 where I was kind of like, okay, this isn't, this isn't working. You're making yourself worse. I used to smoke weed and I stopped smoking weed at like 17, 18 because I knew that was causing problems for me too. Yeah. I'd say now, I'm 27, for the last seven years, I've been able to go outside and live a normal life. Yes, like, I think people don't understand schizophrenia, the voices never actually go. Yeah. They're there 24 yeah. seven. But it's a matter of what are you gonna do to kind of either calm it down or make sure it doesn't affect your day. Cause even yeah. when I'm talking to you, it's still there. Yeah, yeah. But is it like kind of learning how to control it? Yeah. 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 They're not as loud, basically. They're yeah. not loud. They, I don't, it doesn't stop me from doing anything. I was told I wasn't going to be able to do education. I was told I wasn't going to be able to have a proper relationship. I wasn't being, I wouldn't be able to have conversations like this. Yeah. But yeah. I kind of didn't listen to, and I'm not saying to anybody not to listen to your doctors. I didn't listen to my doctors in a sense of, oh my God, you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't do this. I did my own thing and I kind of broke myself out of that because if you think about it, that's what I wish. Yeah. A lot of people with this would just be like, this isn't going to weigh me down. This isn't going to weigh me down. I'm going to do what I want to do. But instead they kind of just make it, 90% of people just Mold make it. into it. it. Yeah, yeah, and then the suicide rate for schizophrenics is, is bad. Yeah, well, that's Especially really sad men. to hear actually, really. Yeah. That is quite sad to hear. But what I wanted to ask you also is that obviously having that knowledge that you've got this condition, d did it kind of have a, an impact on the relationships, be it family or friends? And did you find people kind of step back from you? Yes and no. So I had um, lifelong best friends up until I was like, I'd say 21. Yeah. And um, I've still got my school friends, thank God, because they understood they were there from like the beginning to the end. Yeah. Um, these friends that I'd made were not anybody I had met in school. They were just people. It was kind of like a joke or whatever. So it was kind of like, Ugh, she's got this, but but who cares? We're still going to encourage her to drink. We're still going to, and these things were bad for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd say it kind of walked like my relationships a bit with family and with romantic relationships. Yeah. Romantic relationships, I think because people knew I had this, they were very, it was easy to kind of like, you know, be nice, like treat me like I'm very naive. And at the yeah. time I probably was yeah. because I was still understanding myself. Yeah. And but with like family, it's probably a bit more hurtful, I would say, because it's yeah. kind of like... It's so close to home. Yeah, my parents yeah. never really took any ownership for anything that happened in like my life. So it kind of just escalated into, we didn't do this to you. We didn't give you this mental health. We don't know what trauma they're talking about. Like, do yeah. you know what I mean? So, yeah, no, I get it. But now I'm at a place in my life at this age where I'm like, I don't care who it bothers, who it doesn't bother. I try to debunk it as much as I can because obviously there's a myth of schizophrenics are violent. Yeah. They they'll kill you. They'll do this. They'll do and it's nine none of these times things. out of ten yeah. they're hurting themselves, not yeah. not you. So, so. What advice would you give to other people out there who actually have this condition? I would say. Um, or who who are in the early stages as well. I'd say early stages maybe. Speak to someone that they trust. Doesn't yeah. have to be a doctor straight away because that could be really daunting for somebody to go straight to a doctor and then be like, oh my God, I'm going to get diagnosed. Because I know a couple of people that have had other mental health issues, they've gone straight to a doctor and it's put them in a complete depression because they don't want to hear that. Yeah. Speak to someone that's close to them, like a best friend, their mom, their sister, whoever. And then 
once they get their diagnosis, when they're ready to get it, yeah, I'd say learn yourself. Don't just listen to, okay, well, you're going to have this and you're going to have that. and you're Because that's what I did for so many years and it caused me to be out of it. Um, I'd say to just learn yourself, learn what kind of stops you from having these bad thoughts, learn what, like, just learn yourself. Once you learn your mental health and you learn yourself, it becomes I think it's acceptance as well, isn't it? Once you've accepted, then it goes for anything. Once you've accepted, then things get easier. 100%. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Regini, thank you very much for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure and make sure you keep Keep locked for more episodes of Mind Over Matter. You're listening to Nads. Hello, I'm Eli and this is... I go by the name of Shojon. I'm an all-round creative creator, mental health advocate based in Hertfordshire. So, Shojon, what brings you here today? Well, the mental health system is in mm-hmm. reform right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm leading said reform. Um, there were several changes that need to be made. Yes. Uh, in, I believe it was April 2022. Okay. Um, I had a realization after an incident earlier that year. Right. That had me hospitalized and misdiagnosed with a mental health um, uh, condition. Correct. Right. When. I'm explaining to medical professionals Mm -hmm. my profession, the fact that I'm a mental health advocate and my incident was nothing mental health related. Right. I was still misheard. I was um, hospitalized in a Mm. mental health facility for 10 days. Yes, I believe I read that in in the deprived of my Yes. Deprived of my liberty. Mm -hmm. Um, My name was spelled wrong. They didn't do their due diligence, which made me realize reform was needed in the processing of mental health Mm -hmm. uh, patients uh, of mental health patients and their assessments thereof Um, I couldn't believe it that I was literally placed against my will Mm -hmm. after a medical professional had already diagnosed me with um, potential epilepsy or fit Mm -hmm. as the cause of my incident a a member of uh, a mental health team decided no that was incorrect Mm. didn't do their due diligence on my name um or any of the medication that they claimed that i should be on yet was not on and it was something that i was as a mental health advocate that you know keeps my being cleansed and nourished Mm -hmm. and generally my well-being because i know that you know a healthy body Mm -hmm leads to a healthy mind. That's right. Yep. Positive intentions, mm-hmm. positive vibrations resonate higher than anything else. So as I'm staying afloat, trying to talk to medical professionals right. and you know tell them that they're incorrect, they they didn't hear me properly, mm. which then led to like legal disputes. So I had to call my solicitors, my, my lawyers mm. who right. had trouble mm-hmm. accessing paperwork from, you know, medical facility it's it's my data yes that they wouldn't allow me to 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 access Mm -hmm. which you know brings into question what they were diagnosing me with exactly there was no proof of right right so i you know i i use my status as as i said i'm an all-round creator all-round creative Mm -hmm. actor model musician Mm -hmm. um it was a shame that i had to call so many lawyers just to you know i had to write to the ombudsman Mm -hmm. and you know, various teams within the hospitals that they hospitalized me right. in. It took 10 days for me to be, or it took eight days for me wow. to be, see a, a psychiatrist yeah. for him to sign off and write off the fact that there was, mm-hmm. there's no diagnosis. Right. Let me go. There was no medication needed. There wasn't even an apology. Wow. So the mental health system I say, like I said, I lead with positive yeah. intentions is in reform. Mm-hmm. And it's something that I want people to be very aware of their rights and the, the processes of, you know, when an assessment is made. Listen to medical professionals, mm-hmm. but understand yourself as well. Seek help from, you know, teams. Make sure you have a support system around you. Like, don't just go on the, the, the hearsay of the medical professionals. Mm-hmm. Um, as a mental health advocate, I I always urge people to not just dive into medication. It should be something that they should look into. There's alternative therapies 
like talking therapies, mm-hmm. other ways of dealing with, you know, um, your mental health. Right, but right. The one thing I always lead with, have a cleansed and nourished mm-hmm. being. Right. Make sure you're healthy, mm-hmm. healthy body, healthy mind. So, Shojan, uh, can you give us a bit more insight of what you do in the community and things you're trying to advocate, you know, in regards to mental health, you know, things you might be doing for the youth, you know, things of that nature? Um, well, there's... <clears throat> So I'll tell you there's several things that I do in the community in mm-hmm. general. Okay. Um, so I like to, uh, you know, I'm labelled um, a Greenwich philanthropist. Although okay. I, I'm no longer based in Greenwich. Gotcha. But like <laughs> wherever my company will sponsor like football teams. Yeah. Um, I've helped uh, develop radio stations so that wow. the community have, okay. has a voice. I work with various charities across the board. Um, when it comes to mental health, I have my chocolate bar so I have my oh, own nice. chocolate bar the shojon bar okay which uh, whenever I'm fundraising I use to you know just I'll just give it to the donors yeah, just yeah. to create you know funds for mental health right right um, there were times previous where there wasn't enough government funding being mm. shared although I always say that the mind is the most important part like I agree. you know it's the yeah. difference between you getting up in the morning yep like it's it, positive intentions good vibrations so true man will literally navigate direct yep. your life right so it, i always say it's the difference between you saying uh, i'm gonna get up today mm. i'm gonna go to work and i'm gonna get stuff done right if you wake up and say um i feel that like going to mm-hmm. so, oh, yeah words are powerful man yes yeah. so yeah. i one of the main things that i always suggest to people mm-hmm. is affirmations yes i am is two of the most powerful words in the english dictionary Mm -hmm. put that with some um positive you know positive words right will change your life it starts to like it is your intentions through affirmations so i always suggest you know there's plenty of um Things on, on Spotify that give you affirmations, yeah. YouTube, look up positive affirmations, pick the ones that you feel will resonate with you, you feel that you need. Right. You are in control of your destiny, That's your right. life, yeah. your existence. Right. So it's a thing where I urge everyone, Yes. there's nothing you can't do, but positive vibrations, good vibrations always resonate higher right right so as long as you lead with that mindset you're so much better off that's that's the kind of work that i do in the community i tell everyone positivity affirmations love that man and i I generally feel my community is better off for it so (laughs) i always come on these platforms here to ensure that everybody knows that their real is defined by them and don't let anyone tell you anything different than that i am two powerful words place some positive Mm -hmm. words after that and you'll see a change in your life immediately that's remarkable man that's remarkable and and to add to that i think um as well i know for myself as well i meditate a lot as well um i have to start my day off by meditating um and like you said affirmations and i and the day could probably go in another way that it may seem like it could be bad but because of the mentality that i've carried since i've woken up that day I mean, things just flow naturally and things will come to you and you will realize like, wow, these these really work, you know. Um, so the mind, as you mentioned, is such a powerful tool. Yeah, no, I'd yeah. say, Eli, that's very good that you do meditate, like yeah. mental stability, mm-hmm. like the fact that you take time for yourself to relax, yes. to gather your thoughts, to steady mm-hmm. your whole being. You're in tune with yourself, you yep. understand yourself. I always say to people to intend for an understanding, right. like for their day, for their for their health, Mm-hmm. Intend for it. Yeah. Affirm for an understanding. Exactly. Of said, and you will be surprised at what comes in to to guide you throughout your existence. Exactly, man. Well said once again, man. So, Sojin, thank you for your time. Audience, thank you for your time for this remarkable conversation that we had today. Any more words you would like to say before we end it? Uh, yes. If anyone wants to, you know, look up on my story, that's at my website, www.shojohn.cool. Shojon is spelled S-H-O-J-O-N and cool, like I am. Um, I'd also say um, check me out on Instagram, Shojon underscore G, as well as my music on uh, all the major streaming platforms. And there you go. There you have it. Once again, that was Shojon. Audience, thank you again. Until next time, stay tuned.
Hi, my name is Claire Commons, and today I'm going to be interviewing Monica. We're going to be talking about being in a relationship with a narcissist. So, Monica, welcome to Mind Over Matter. Thank you for joining me here today. Thank so you. today we're going to be talking about uh, narcissism. But firstly, um, I'd like to find a little bit more about you. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Monica. I'm a 35 years old Hungarian girl. And what shall I start? <laughs> and when did you come over to the UK? Um, I come here in the UK in 2014. Okay. I start with a babysitting job. I build up my career learning the English language. Um, started from zero, having waitress job, working in catering. And I start uh, university as well. Brilliant. But until the COVID period, I kind of stop it. <laughs> so. so what made you come to the UK? Uh, that is a bit long story. So um, I come here because It's okay, take a breath. Um, so tell me a little bit about the experience you had. I know that you had some relationships that didn't go so well. So why don't we start with your first relationship. Tell me a little bit about that one. Yeah, I try to express myself. I mean, I experienced a really bad relationship. I was in a relationship with a narcissistic person and um, it's kind of destroy me, destroy actually all my personality, my soul. It's kind of take away my spirit as well. So, um, sorry. so tell me how long how long ago was that? How long ago were you in that relationship? Yeah, so we was together five and a half year. Mm -hmm. Then I come here in this country to start over. Mm -hmm. I left everyone there, my family. Uh, my friends and I was like, I'm gonna start a new chapter, <laughs> totally. <laughs> and sorry. <laughs> You're doing great. So if we went back to that relationship, why don't you tell me a little bit more about that partner, about what happened, um, and how it affected you? It's okay. I just feel a little bit like I'm taking a deep breath because yeah. um, I start to recognize. I mean, like I've. I feel the moment, so it's all the back, bad memories coming back. So that's why I was, mm. I was a bit waiting. Uh, so what actually happened? I was still loving the my first love, and when I got in the relationship, I was kind of a little bit like not confused, but a little bit sad emotionally. So I, I think I didn't really finish. I didn't really close that chapter. Then straight away I jump in a new one. Then um, I was young, I was naive, I, was, I want someone to love me. So as soon as our relationship starts, it's kind of... I get attached to that person. So everything what he said, I, it was like a saint for me. So... <laughs> Sorry, what it was before the question? <laughs> No, I mean, I, re I relate to what you're saying because, you know, I also date a narcissist, so I do relate. And I often find that people, the narcissists seem to find that broken piece in you and then they start to manipulate that piece. And like you were saying now, like you just told me um, that you uh, didn't finish the last relationship, so maybe something wasn't, wasn't fixed inside you and then you yeah. started a new relationship on that. So that's what I find narcissists tend to do, yeah? Yeah, yeah. You think you're more actually, vulnerable almost, right? Yeah, so um, that guy after said after a short period, if I'm not gonna change, he's just gonna leave me. So that it was the point, you, you said the weakest point. Uh, when I felt like, no, 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 this one as well, I don't want that to finish because it's already something what it was not finished and I felt it's my fault. Mm. So I don't want this to end the same. So that it when it start doesn't matter what he was telling me i was just following he was saying i was loving him and i just listened like a blind person and that's all <laughs> so i don't want to really go uh, what he was doing with me because i can have some bad memories but yeah okay. this it was the was the it emo emotional uh, almost uh, emotional manipulation yeah yeah it, it was even the silent 
treatment, treatment and everything, yeah. especially he was playing with my emotions and stuff. Mm. So actually what happened to, for the first two years, he was like a totally different person. He was nice and showing like everything just, he's a kind person, mm. he's an angel or something. And after two years, he, he changed his style, he changed personality. Then he said, uh, I was asking about, oh, why you are wearing a nice shirt or a different style? And he said, I'm sorry, but I don't want to look uh, good for you. Now I want to look good for someone else. And I was like, wait, what? Then started from there, he was a totally different person. And even he put in the Facebook that he's in an open relationship in 2013. I, I checked back, I mean later, but when I find out, I was like, Jesus, I was so naive how, how I didn't see this one. So what yes. happened then from there onwards? What happened? So after that, I was just running and he, in one point, he told me that he want to end the relationship. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I, I cannot let you go. And I just, I was like holding him tightly. Mm. And the thing what happened, he was just looking after another girl. So he was and with somebody else, is what you said? Like, yeah, he tried flirting and he said that we are not together, but he always called me over. So, mm. so he was with me, but he was chasing someone else like three and a half years. Then we stayed together, but he was just kind of using me, but I didn't say this. Mm. I talked with my father and he said that uh, don't go over his house, his place because you're gonna just destroy yourself yeah. and you, you're just gonna suffer more. But I know, no, no, I, I love him, everything is fine, I can handle, I can control, but no, I couldn't. Mm. So I was just going there and deep inside me is just dying again and coming out so I couldn't starting the cycle again, right, yeah, and yeah, go back to yeah. it. So, did so you I, was, I was always falling. So actually what happened, I, um, I left the country first, then I was running back. I was going first so to Hungary. So you went back? To yeah, Hungary. I went back. For then, him? Yeah. Well, you did. So you came here the, to try and... No, I was first in Hungary, then the fir when I was in Ireland, uh, I ran home after four months. Okay, because you wanted to be with him? Yeah, and what did he say? Yeah, he, he just got a contract and he left in Germany. Then mm. we, we said that we're going to meet in London. Then and he never gonna came? Yes, uh, it was the word, we, we're going to have a new relationship there. But you know what he said? He said that uh, don't accept me just walking in the park and taking our hand and stuff like that. It's just going to be sex, nothing else. Then I felt like I am broken. Yeah. So that, that it was the point when I said, said no, enough is enough. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, what did you learn from that? I'm going to talk about where, where you yeah, are. Yeah, I'm going to sorry. talk just now. <laughs> just no, 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 no. I mean, thank you for sharing with me uh, and, the, and the viewers. Um, but I I'd love to, to hear what your takeaways are from that experience. And then I want to chat a little bit about where you are in your life now. Yeah. Like so how I open my eyes or yeah, how I see the... Yes. The what, did you, what did you learn from that relationship? And um, what has made you stronger? Because you've obviously um, moved on from it, which I would love to hear about mm. just now. Um, but I mean, I know that it's very hard and it can take some time to get over things like this emotionally. Um, you know, you've got to do the work and work, you know, they've gone, they, 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 they've already left, you know, the partner, yeah. but you're, si you're sitting there with all of all the emotional, yeah. sitting out with a heavy heart. Yeah. So I wanted to find out how you overcame it or what are your takeaways that maybe you can share with the viewers? Yeah. Wow, uh, so actually that didn't start or didn't happen to one second to another. I decided that I need to do something for myself to survive this whole situation. So I take the first step, I come out from my country, I left everything, I come here, I started to work. Then I meet a really good guy here <laughs> who built up on me. I mean, I felt like I can trust him. Then we become friends and started from there, my soul started a little bit to relax and even my personality, I felt like like I'm in a good place, mm, mm. so even I was a bit like testing him because I felt like 
after that relationship I cannot trust nobody else. Mm. So I kind of always I was doing some little tests. It's not, it was not conscious, but it's kind of because of my fears and everything. So I was testing him in everything, <laughs> like if I can trust him or he's a good guy, he, he have got manners, he, he's just like, you know, the emotional stuff, if his heart is in his place and everything is just mm. fine with him. And when I done this, after that, I was like, okay, now I can just open up slowly, slowly. You're cautious, which is good, yeah? <sighs> yeah, after a long time. Exactly, you, you need, need to protect yourself, yeah, though. Yeah, yeah. You know, you've got to learn. I mean, I, know, I can speak from my, per, uh, personally, my experience is that I also had to do work on myself and then I had to learn to trust again as well. Yeah, yeah. That mean, is the hardest. Exactly, yeah, because your trust is broken. And yeah. Emotionally, you're really, really affected, and you don't know what's real, what's not really. Yeah, um, yeah, that, that is. Oh God, <laughs> don't. Yeah, <laughs> you make the point. Yeah, that is clear. But you just got to be kind with yourself and give time. I mean, it sounds like yeah. you were very brave. You moved countries, so I mean, that's very, very brave to do that. And even if you, you know. I mean, now you're happier. You're much happier. Yeah, so you took yeah. the you took the steps. You were brave enough to say, "I need to remove myself from that situation um, and go and start afresh." And it has worked out for you in the end. It's been a journey, though. I'm sure. Yeah, but the first three, four years, yeah. I couldn't. I couldn't. I, I was like holding everything together. Mm. I never ask no help or something because I am from my childhood I am some kind of like taking responsibilities mm. and everything so I, I just like to struggle alone <laughs> I know it sounds egoist but sometimes it's hard but, to reach uh, out yeah. as well it's not easy to reach so out so I felt like I'm too weak so I need some time to digest some stuff and let everything go to to just give some time for myself mm. to relax then after if I feel strong enough to face it, the mm. whole shit, sorry. <laughs> it's also to build yourself up though, your confidence and everything up, right? It's, yeah, it's so then, many then different can... things, right? Oh, you know, after coming out of a relationship, you, there's so many things going on. So it's not just one thing, is what I'm saying. You know, you've got to build your confidence, your emotions, so many different things that you need to build yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, you become stronger, but you don't see the bigger picture. Yeah. You just start somewhere, then, then I don't know. I felt like I never not gonna come out from that dark because I was even in depression at home. Yeah. And um, I just come here and I remember so many times I was crying to yeah. the present boyfriend and I keep continuously telling the same memories and everything and he keep listening. And uh, I just felt, is not never not gonna end so yeah. it's i can say that in the last couple of two three years i feel like i am just ev evolving i mean like i put some steps so i'm going in the right direction you know after years i needed to put myself like i clearly remember i was having a job in a pizza shop and um, i was managing the staff and i was uh, I, sometimes i didn't even have time to eat and I was like, no, I'm gonna put myself and once a day I need to eat because otherwise I'm not gonna have energy to keep the control mm. and everything. So this it was the first step. Then I, I have got some extra kilograms, then started from there. I felt more confident. Honestly, this is helps a lot. Always in my life I want some extra. So I'm yeah. totally happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. amazing. I mean, that's really, I mean, you've really done the work and taken a step so that you can have a happier life mm -hmm. and leave that behind you. Yeah. So, um, what, uh, what advice would you give to uh, one of our viewers or any of our viewers that are watching um, that maybe they want to leave a bad situation and they don't know how to do it? I mean, you were very brave, you left a country and we're not saying everybody has to move countries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what would you say to them? Like, what would be their your advice to them if they needed to leave a bad situation? I will not gonna say that I was brave. I felt like just in that way how I was, I cannot stand up for myself. So in my mind I was like, let's just take all my shit together and put somewhere, bring somewhere where I can be myself and I can be open up. I can just freely express myself without no judging. So it's kind of I hide, let's say, <laughs> but it helps me a lot. So um, advice. Um, the only thing I can suggest that to believe in yourself. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how dark, how hard, just um, have patience. That is, that, is, that is the main thing, because if you don't have patience with, with yourself, 
I tried to love myself, but, but always I was like, I tried to push things and I tried to be more perfect, more everything just... But I cannot, I am human, so I have got my limits. <laughs> so I just wanted to say thank you so much um, for sharing your story with us, Monica, and being here today. And to our viewers, if uh, you have any of the problems that we discussed today, make sure you stay tuned. At the end, we'll have the mental health hotline there for you. Please do call it. Don't be alone. I've been joined today by the lovely Anna Story, a mental health specialist. So Anna, do you feel like there's a mental health crisis in this country? Well, I think there is. Yeah, I definitely think there is. Just by the sheer number of people who are looking for help. Increasing in your clients, yeah, for example? Yeah, just increase, I don't know, tenfold, twentyfold. Yeah. And do you feel like we're dealing with it in the right way? Uh, no, I don't think we are. I mean, there are facilities at unis, there are more schools which employ counsellors, so that's all better. But unless you can pay privately, then unfortunately you can't find the counsellor. You have to wait for months and months and months, which is ridiculous and it could be dangerous. So as a mental health specialist, you're seeing an increase in your, in your clients yeah. and in your patients, just not enough resources for you? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and I know people who can't find a counsellor and really they, and they can't pay. They keep looking and they keep waiting and they still don't find one. Perhaps there needs to be more done in terms of training up new therapists and new mental health specialists. Do you think that's an area as well that needs to be looked at? Well, I think there are enough specialists, like BACP has many members, but for example, NHS is mostly employing CBT therapists, so they probably should be more inclusive and embrace all sorts of other modalities, rather than just say we only use that. And that would be vastly helpful. So kind of a broader approach yeah. to mental health therapy. Yeah. Yeah. You touched upon, uh, you mentioned CBT there. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means and maybe different approaches that therapists try? Well, practice. I'm not CBT therapist myself, but CBT is more directive therapy, which is addressing your behaviour, how you do things, and you get homework to do and to change your behaviour. Right. So it's kind of short term, usually. Okay. And there are approaches which might take years, and you delve really deep into your unconscious, and you have to work really hard and remember things. And okay. It takes a lot of time and effort. Also, there is coaching, which is again more directive, there is homework, it's more... And when you say shorter. homework, do you mean like going home and sort of yeah. journaling your yeah, emotions? Yeah, you have certain yeah, exercises to do and journaling is generally a good thing and then you can always do it yourself and lots of therapists advise clients to do that. Yeah, it's a really great way to kind of get your feelings out on yeah. paper. Yeah, but there are all sorts of Modality. So it, when, if you're looking for therapies, probably just go and see different ones and see which one you prefer, which one is for you. I think that's really important. Yeah. It's, you know, we're yeah. all very different. We all exactly. have different yeah. personalities. We all have come with different traumas. Yeah. So it's really important we find the therapist that sort of works yeah. for and us. Yeah, and therapist should work for you. You yeah. should like therapist. Yeah. If you come and see a therapist and you don't like him or her, don't, don't try hard to you know, and try to like him. Yeah. Because there is no point, just go and see somebody else. Yeah, I think that's great advice, absolutely. Yeah. Otherwise you might feel like you're not getting anywhere. Yeah. Where in fact, yeah. it's not you, it's just you need a different approach. Exactly. To try something yeah. new. Absolutely, that's brilliant. As a mental health specialist, and someone who takes on a lot of, perhaps, trauma, how do you cope? How do you deal with, with the things that you hear, the things that you have to listen to? How do you look after your mental health? Well, that's very important questions because quite a few training institutions which train therapists are not really teaching therapists how to look after themselves. And that leads to burnouts and therapists dropping out of profession. So obviously we have supervision. So you talk to your supervisor once a month, which is great. But sometimes it's just not enough. So you have to be able to monitor yourself. And if you feel like you don't really want to see clients at all, like you feel really bad after each session and 
clients have to get to you, you keep thinking about your work, you probably need to stop and just have some therapy yourself, yeah. which I do from time to time, and it's extremely useful, and not with the same therapist, I sometimes change modalities, and just look after yourself, do yeah. things you like, and yeah. see your friends, and Absolutely. not just be focused on your work and yeah. just stuck in it. Yeah. I think that's really important, really simple advice like you said, yeah. do things that you enjoy, socialise, yeah. spend time with the people you love, people yeah, that love you, totally. that's, that's yeah. really key, you know, and you have to look after yourself, you're looking yeah. after us, you need to yeah. look after yourself. Otherwise you can't, yeah, you yeah. can't be the helper who can't help yourself, yeah. For those out there who might be struggling with their mental health for any reason, thinking about therapy or not so sure, what's your advice for them? Well, I think it's important to have people around with whom you can share your concerns. Sometimes you don't. If you do, it's great to even talk to your friend, and, but sometimes you don't want to burden your nearest and dearest or they can give you advice with a, you know, really wishing the best for you, but that might not be quite the right advice. So it's, it is good to go and see therapists, just to get somebody neutral, to listen to you, to maybe give you, tell you something that your family member wouldn't tell you, Absolutely. not wanting to upset you or Absolutely. whatever reason. Yeah. So that, that would be great. So just, just give it a try. You can have one session, if you don't like it, Oh. Yeah, sometimes your friends and family, they, they don't want to tell you everything, you know, they don't yeah. want to hurt your feelings. Yeah. So it's yeah. great that you, you know, you have a, a mental health professional like yourself yeah. who can step in, who can bring that kind of objectivity, that neutrality yeah. to the situation. And, yeah, you know, something, exactly. Uh, and somebody new. Somebody new to the know, situation. Don't have history with really. yeah. yeah. It brings a very healthy dynamic to it. Yeah. Yeah. That's brilliant advice. Uh, what's the future for mental health, in your opinion? How can we move forward and get better? Uh, looking after ourselves and looking after our mental health? Well, I think the whole dynamic of people talking about mental health is, is great. Yeah. And that it, it's becoming normalised, that it should be part of our life. That Absolutely. That we all have some form of therapy, maybe short term, maybe there is plenty of it online now and it's more affordable. That would be great. And there are different ways of therapy being developed. So that I think that should be become our norm and then everybody can kind of almost learn about it at school, like how we Absolutely. work, why do we react to things the way we do and then we will be much better dealing with our emotions. Absolutely, understanding our emotions and dealing yeah. with them better. Brilliant, yeah. brilliant advice. And I don't think I could do what you do. <laughs> That's fantastic. Really, thank you for coming onto the show and joining us um, for your advice. You are welcome. Thank yeah, you so much. Yeah, I enjoyed it too. Yeah, thank you for having me. Once again, this has been My Never Matter, episode four, and I've been Sophia. Thank you for watching us. That's the last of our one-to-one -one interviews. Up next is our panel discussion. Good afternoon, it's Anastasia and I'm here with Ayman and Josiah and we're here to discuss why do people fear uh, their mental health issues and whatever they're going through. Um, that's part of our panel discussion and after that we will be doing mental health games and whoever gets the most questions right, they win a prize. Um, so, the questions that we will be asking in this discussion, each guest has to answer the question in a 10 word answer. So, the first question is, why do some people fear sharing their mental health issues? I think it's due to a fear of being misjudged. Trauma and misjudgment. Second question, can you define mental health? Instability. Social, emotional and psychological well-being. And the third question, how would you describe the coping mechanisms? Getting lots of sleep, drinking lots of water, exercising and listening to music. 
finding the right people, doing the right exercises, and spending the right amount of time with yourself. Okay, great. So now moving on to a mental health game called Do You Know? So this consists of a few questions uh, and each guest needs to write their answer down um, and whoever gets the most questions right wins a prize. So we are here to play a mental health game called Do You Know? And each guest has 10 seconds to write down the definition of each word. Okay, so the first question is, what is PTSD? <laughs> okay, so you've got your answers? Nope. Yep. Okay, one point to Iman and zero for Josiah. Okay, so the next question. Do you know what depression is? Okay, show your answers, please. She's still writing. She was still writing. Okay. You heard so that. You saw that, didn't you? Yes. It was okay. Like Can you read any of this? No, you can't. Exactly. So what's the point? I can't read that. So two point, one point for Josiah and one point for Iman. It's a draw. Okay. Third question. Describe in your own words. What is bipolar? Okay, 10 seconds is up. Show your answers. Okay, so that is three points to Josiah. Oi, oi. And one point to Iman. We have a winner. Josiah is our winner. So you will receive your prize in the post yeah, yeah. within a few days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for watching and we hope we entertained you and stay tuned for the next episode. Goodbye for now.